Welcome to First Wednesday Online, a special online service uh, as we celebrate First Wednesday. But we also get a chance to talk about one of my all-time favorite topics, uh, the second coming of Jesus Christ. And so we're going to be digging into that tonight. But hey, uh, I want to say a big shout out to everybody who's watching. And we have this really cool monitor, right, Zach? Yeah. in front of us. And so uh, you might see Chuck, Tracy, or I look at a different direction. We're really just checking out what you guys are saying in the chat. Yeah. So we're going to love being able to do that with you. But anyway, I'm super excited that just like last time, uh, Tracy and Zach are joining with me to talk about the last days. And uh, I need to announce something that's kind of fun. Uh, for a long time, we have teased Tracy about her inability to cook. Uh, and because I want to be honest, she could not cook. She even told me once she made a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and that tasted bad. Yeah, <laughs> but true. now you could cook. Yes, uh, for the fast, I did the Whole30, which was uh, super challenging. I did it when we came back from Armenia, and so I did it um, after the fast started. I just ended technically yesterday, but it forces you to cook because you just you can't eat out, and uh, you have to eat very whole foods, and that can get boring very quickly when you're limiting yourself to salad and no protein. So um, I started cooking. I made a few things that were kind of terrible that first week, um, <laughs> and I didn't realize it was going to be bad, and I used like four chicken breasts, and it was just, and I ate it. I, I mean, I forced myself to eat it, but it, I did force myself to eat it. It was uh, pretty rough, but um, I worked on it, and... Um, now, 30 days after, I can say I've made some pretty good things. So I can cook now, Crossroads. Yeah, and one of your favorite cooking utensils is? Yes, it is a cast iron skillet that you got me, Pastor Chuck. And uh, I love to cook in it because it makes everything, it cooks everything so evenly. And uh, one of the things that I didn't make good was tilapia the first time. I, I was trying to, I got a little uh, creative. I got a little out there with some fish. And um, <laughs> the pan I used did not make it good. And I was reading that if you use a cast iron skillet, it's going to really like just blacken it the way that it's supposed to be and it did it worked out so now I use the cast iron for everything I made um ground turkey and uh, uh stir fry with ground beef and um I made some chicken and some shrimp and see it's like good yeah, things see, you're, I you're can like do it I did it, it. yeah yeah <laughs> I love it and cast iron skillets are one of the best things to cook in because they retain some of this flavoring in them so the more you use them the better they're the better they are 100% I'm going to shout out Ernie Mitchison because he yep. shared with me that you don't you cannot clean your cast iron with soap and you had told me this in the beginning Pastor Chuck but he like reiterated it because I was tempted to because I, I cooked fish and that just was gross. I'm all, what do you mean I don't use soap to cook, uh, to clean this? Um, but Ernie said, no, he sent me some videos uh, from yeah, <laughs> YouTube yeah. on how to take care of your cast iron skillet. And so, and both Ernie and Pastor Chuck got me like a brush, a cast iron brush to use. And uh, I've seasoned it with some avocado oil after each time just to make it ready. So... I've grown a lot in these you're, last you're, 30 days. You're, you're, you're loving it. I can yeah. tell the passion. And you love to cook, right, Zach? I do. I love to cook. And actually, funnily enough, on the note of tilapia, if you ever mix it with peanut butter, oh. it's oh. not that bad. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, but not that bad. <laughs> So Better than I did either. my first week. Yeah. Um, I do love to cook. I got a knife set for my family not too long ago, and it's just so much fun getting to cook. And um, one of my cooking dishes involves chicken and jalapenos and cilantro and cream. Blend that all up and pour it on the grilled chicken. It's incredible. Um, and so I'm a huge breakfast person. I guess more of a breakfast person, lunch or dinner, or all of it. I you? like to have breakfast for dinner. So oh. I don't, I typically skip breakfast, but scrambled eggs. And again, this is a hard thing to mess up. You can put <laughs> anything in scrambled eggs and it comes out good. But I like that for dinner. Yeah. It's also the easiest to cook. <laughs> Whatever, Zach. It's good. Okay. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Um, I actually am more of a dinner person. So yeah. Uh, but, you know, I love food and I love what, you know, I love that God made it so we can celebrate. And the interesting thing about food to me is it's really about fellowship. Uh, it's about being with other people and sharing with other people and getting yeah. to do that. Uh, there is an event coming up that yes. a lot of people are going to be sharing in. And Zach, you uh, got pretty excited about it. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so I found out today uh, that on April 8th, there's going to be what's known as a historical solar eclipse. Mm -hmm. And so we have a graphic we're going to put up on the screen right here. It's going to show you the, the shadow, the spread of the solar eclipse that's going to happen on April 8th. Um, it's pretty fascinating. I get kind of excited about some space stuff like this. And so um, be ready for it. If you're on the East Coast or if you find yourself right where the path of the total eclipse is, Put it in the chat. Just put path in the chat. Let us know. Um, but I will be outside that day, not looking at the sun, yeah. uh, but just trying to check it out and have some fun with it. But it's really interesting that uh, that slice that you guys see that says total eclipse will complete be complete darkness. And so mm -hmm. I thought that was a little fitting uh, for the end times part two discussion. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I think it kind of gets us going on that. Um, uh, but I also want to point out something else that's interesting. Uh, before we dive into our study in two weeks, not this Sunday. Sunday, but next Sunday, uh, we're going to kick off a financial series. Uh, and I am super excited about this series. Uh, I want to teach you what the Bible says about money. It's interesting. 67% of people say they need financial advice and 59% of them say they don't know who to turn to. Well, the person to turn to is God. I, I want you to go to the Bible. I want you to learn what it says. But I also want to tell you this. I've been studying and studying and studying, and I, I've actually found stuff in there that I've never shared with you before. Uh, it's financial advice. It's very practical, obviously biblical, but I've never shared it before. So I cannot wait for you to hear what God has to say about your finances. But it's not about how you can get rich. <clears throat> it's about how you can get free. So I want you to have a heart for financial freedom that turns into a lifestyle of financial freedom where you're living secure and not afraid, where you're able to be generous. Why? Because you're finding the blessing of God come. And so to me, I'm so excited to share it with you. Not this Sunday. Uh, Ed Stetzer will be with us. He's going to be great. But a week from Sunday, and I want you to be a part of that. By the way, it's also interesting, the timing of this, because right now the lottery just went over $1 billion. So Powerball, if you had a ticket uh, and you won, you could uh, win a billion dollars, or you could take $527 million in a one-time payment. What would you take? I feel like I would take the $527 million right away. Okay. <laughs> I would. What about you, Tracy? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I would also take the 527 million. I feel like both of these numbers are just so big, it's hard for my brain yeah, to yeah. comprehend. So, yes, I would just take what I can. <laughs> what about you, Pastor Chuck? Yeah, I think I would take the 527. And, of course, we all three agreed uh, that we would tithe and more. And uh, uh, we get really excited about paying off the church's debt. Yes. And then also we would love to uh, be able to scholarship kids to, uh, to our school. Uh, but also, I would say this kids in Kenya, I would love to scholarship a lot of them to come to the United States uh, to be able to go to universities and stuff. So there's all these fun things you could think about. But here's what else I want you to know. The odds of you winning are 1 in 292 million. So if you buy a ticket... Your odds are one and 292 million. But if you follow the financial advice of the Bible, it's 100%. So better than a lottery ticket is the word of God, which will give you sure answers for how to handle your finances. Uh, and why do, again, do, should we talk about this? Jesus talked about money constantly. There's more verses in the Bible on money than there is on heaven and hell combined. Uh, so we need to understand how important it is. Why? Because it's a matter of the heart. And in Matthew chapter 6, verse 21, Jesus said, where your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be, or there your heart will be. And so uh, we know it's a spiritual issue. It's a heart issue. Uh, right now, though, we are going to have a time of offering for those of you who use Wednesday night to give to God. And so you could text give to 77247. Text give to 77247 or go on our app or uh, uh, on the Crossroads website, right? So you could do that. But uh, Tracy, you want to lead us in prayer for our time of giving? Yes, for sure. Father God, I thank you so much because we know that we um, have the ability to work and to um, make money because you give us that ability. And I pray that uh, you would make us really good stewards of the finances that we have. I pray for each person um, that gives. I pray that you would just bless them, yeah. Father. I pray that you would um, put that obedience on their heart to trust you in their finances first. I pray for the church that you would um, make us good stewards of all the money that's given. I pray that this offering would go to just bless so many. And I pray that um, I just pray your favor over it, Father. 
and that we would see this multiplied, uh, that, that only you can multiply it in incredible ways. And we just pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen, amen. So anyway, last time we uh, were together on a first Wednesday, we talked about the last days, but we specifically talked about the rapture of the church, which we probably will get into tonight. We'll see uh, what kind of timing we have uh, on that. But I thought it'd be really cool to do this. Rather than focusing on that one event, what if we step back and look at the big picture? What if we begin to look at everything that Jesus wants us to know about his coming again, the second coming, and also the rapture of the church? So I want to make sure we do that together uh, and, and are a part of that. But so here, let me kind of give you a little bit of background. Uh, we're at a time in the world that's very, very scary. Uh, one of the reasons it's scary is we're running out of clean drinking water. As a matter of fact, in the year 2040, in the year 2040, which is not what, six, uh, how, it's just not very far away, uh, 16 years away. Yeah, 16 years away, we will be out of clean drinking water in the world. And so that's going to escalate the violence. We're going to see more and more traumatic things happen. And obviously, the scariest part of all is the poorest of the poor are the ones who will suffer the most. And so that, that we're ticking down towards that. The other thing that's really scary to me about that is nobody's doing anything about it. Like no one is actually doing anything to start dealing with the problem that's coming so quickly towards us. In 2060, we're going to run out of fossil fuel. In other words, there's not going to be any oil. And, and the world is not ready to, be, uh, uh, to not function without oil. So that for sure will create a crisis, which will probably create a war. So one of those two or both of those are going to create a war-like uh, uh, atmosphere in the world. And so we know that peace is already not here, but we also know that the world's in trouble. In the midst of all of that, we as believers are seeing signs that Jesus said would happen happening. Now, Jesus came the first time, which we'll call the first coming of Jesus Christ, to come as the Messiah who would die on the cross for our sins. Jesus told over and over again he would come a second time. Then he would come literally to judge the world. So he comes to gather his church together and then to judge the world. But what I don't want you to miss is this. The first coming prophecies of Jesus Christ we find in the Old Testament were all literally fulfilled. So that's one of the things to keep in mind when we think about prophecy in general, but especially second coming prophecy. None of the prophecies were just symbols. They were all literally fulfilled. So that's going to be true also of the second coming. All the signs we're about to look at, all the things Jesus is telling us will be literally fulfilled in our lifetime. Now, one of the things I was talking to you guys about ahead of time is what are some of the first coming prophecies you could think of that happened that were literally fulfilled? So my, my sister got to go with you to the Holy Land with the church uh, about two years ago. And uh, she took pictures of when they took Jesus' clothes and they cast lots for them, right? And you can see the writing on the, on, on the floor. And that was a prophecy that was fulfilled that happened. Yeah, Psalm 22 says that. They would gamble for his clothes. And, and literally, they gambled for his clothes. By the way, Psalm 22 is a description of a crucifixion, uh, a way of dying by crucifixion. And what you need to know is when Psalm 22 was written, there was no crucifixion. It had not been invented yeah. yet. Mm -hmm. And yet it now is, it was described exactly in Psalm 22. Yeah. Zach, go ahead. Uh, one of my favorite Bible passages is, is Isaiah 53 because it describes Jesus as a tender shoot, almost like a small plant. Um, and then we see the fulfillment in it in Paul's letter to Philippians, in Philippians 2, 5 through 9. He be, God became man. Um, he grew yeah. up in our in our likeness, bearing the perfect example of what it means to be uh, like Christ. And so it's really cool to see, uh, and I know you love this too, is when we see the promises of the Old Testament uh, reflect in the New Testament. And so we have a whole uh, section of Scripture in Isaiah 53 that shows us, yeah, he'll grow up in like a tender shoot, like a child, growing up and then bearing God's character, his nature, his personality, um, and then the promise in Philippians 2, 5 through 9, that him becoming like a man. Yeah. Um, and so I really, I, I really appreciate that. Yeah, and then Isaiah 53 also says that when he dies, he would be beaten beyond recognition. Yeah. You know, and so we know they, that's it's something else that was literally fulfilled. Uh, kind of a, a quick thing to point out that I think is so interesting. Isaiah 50 is also a prophecy of the uh, passion 
of Jesus' betrayal, his arrest, his torture. Um, and in that one, it says they ripped the beard out of his face. Now, there's nowhere in the New Testament that says that happened. But since everything else happened, it's almost for sure. It, well, actually, it's for sure it did. But here's what else is interesting, at least to me. It says when they ripped the beard out of his face, he did not turn his head. In other wow. words, that's how tough Jesus is. <laughs> I mean, if you rip my beard, my hair is going to go everywhere. <laughs> but if you grab Jesus and rip, he would just look you in the eye, yeah. you know, which I, I think tough. is such an interesting yeah. description of him. Yeah. But what I really want us to grab hold of is when the Bible says he would be born of a virgin, he was born of a virgin. Mm-hmm. When the Bible says he was born in Bethlehem, he was born in Bethlehem. When the Bible says that he would enter Jerusalem riding on a donkey, he didn't come in riding on a horse. He rode on a donkey. Uh, and when the Bible says that he would uh, be uh, you know, killed the way he was killed on the cross, he was. So every single thing of those prophecies was literally fulfilled. So now when we begin to look at the last days, we can trust and know that every prophecy we're about to look at tonight is going to happen. Uh, it's 100% going to happen. It's going to take place. And I want you to be ready for that and, and be aware of what's going to occur that way. Now, how do we know we're in the last days? Well, the Bible says, and Jesus specifically said, there's a great sign to look for. So there's one sign more than any other you would look for that says that we're in the last days. And once that sign takes place, the countdown to the coming of Jesus happens. And so what is that sign? It's that Israel would become a nation and that Jerusalem would be back in the hands of the Jews. Now, when Jesus gave that prophecy, he gave it in Jerusalem. But what's interesting is he said that because they did not recognize him, because they did not recognize the day of their visitation, which what you brought out, Zach, that God came and visited us in human form. Because they didn't recognize that, that what one of the punishments that would occur is that there would be a huge army that would come and lay siege to the city of Jerusalem. And everybody who would be trapped inside would end up going through a horrible, horrible time of carnage and pain and starvation. Now, Jesus warned the church, when you see that beginning to occur, you get out. Get out as fast as you can. So we know historically that in 70 AD, when the Roman general Titus came and he laid siege to the city of Jerusalem, that the Christians fled. They didn't stay in the city. They knew it would fall. They knew that uh, the temple would be so destroyed that not one stone would be left upon another. And so they did. They fleed. So the Christians were saved. The non-believers were not. The ones who didn't believe in Jesus were trapped inside. And the Romans tried to starve the people out. But after a while, they weren't able to starve them out any longer because they started to get word that the people inside were eating their own children, which is also a prophecy in Deuteronomy 28 of what would happen if they did not recognize the coming of the Messiah. And Deuteronomy 28 talked about that occurring, and it was occurring. And so when Titus heard that was happening, he said, no more. And they just literally stormed this city, knocking down the walls, breaking down the gates, coming in. But then somehow, for some reason, all of a sudden the Romans went crazy. And they began to kill person after person after person. And when they came up to the temple, a bunch of people ran inside the temple to hide. And the Romans put wood all around it, and they lit a fire hoping to burn them out. But instead, every single person inside died. Then the fire got so hot that the gold on the temple began to melt. It literally liquefied and melted, going between the crevices of the bricks and the stones. And when it finally cooled off, uh, the Romans had a policy that whatever they took, whatever loot they took, whatever treasures they took was each a soldier's possession. And so the soldiers began to want to get the gold off the temple, especially out of the crevices. So they actually tore down every single stone. So not one stone was left up on another. A literal fulfillment of what Jesus said would occur. Then Jesus said that that the church would be scattered throughout the known Roman world and that Jerusalem would be in the hands of Gentiles, non-Jewish people, until the time of the Gentiles is fulfilled. So what is the great sign we're talking about? Jerusalem becoming, again, the possession of the Jewish people. So in Luke 21, verse 12, Jesus uses these words, 
before all these things. In other words, before the signs of my coming, before all the signs of my coming, which by the way are going to happen in order, before all these things, and verse 24 says, they will fall by the edge of the sword and be led away captive into all the nations and Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles are fulfilled. So all of that happened exactly like Jesus said. Uh, the Jews were dispersed all around the world. We know that uh, many went to Russia. Many went to Germany. We know that Hitler then uh, did the Holocaust where he slaughtered uh, as many Jewish people as he could. Uh, and then uh, after the World War II was over, there was the Zionist movement where they wanted to go back to their land and they wanted to be back in the promised land. And then they began to have to flock there in great, great numbers. In 1948, they were declared a nation again. May the 14th, 1948, by the way. And then in June of 1967, the Six-Day War happened. And in June of 67, uh, Moshe Dayan, who was leading the Israeli military while in the midst of fighting five nations that were attacking them, he turned a significant amount of their army towards the city of Jerusalem. Matter of fact, nobody knows why he did it. Uh, they thought, well, maybe he thought they were going to lose. Maybe he thought, uh, you know what, that might be a strategic move to stop the war. But he went and took the city of Jerusalem. And the head rabbi went up on the Temple Mount and blew the shofar and said, the Messiah will come in our lifetime. Now, what's so interesting is 1967, the time of the Gentiles ended. 1967, we see that great event occur. And so, Zach and Tracy, I know you know we've got this timeline chart that we want everybody to see. But don't miss this, that the great sign that we're in the last days has happened. Jerusalem is in the hands of the Jewish people. The time of the Gentiles ended, as Jesus said, and the countdown began for the coming of Jesus Christ, our Messiah. And so now we're going to watch for all the other signs to take place. Because remember what it says in Luke 21. He said, before all these things, Jerusalem's got to be back in the hands of the Jewish people. Then we start to look at the signs being fulfilled in our days, in our time. Now, one thing I want you to look at is the timeline. First of all, Israel becomes a nation, uh, which fulfills Ezekiel 37 and Isaiah 11, 11, And that happened in 1948. Also, interestingly, peace was taken from the earth in 1948, which we'll get to later on is one of the signs of the coming of the Lord. Then in 1967, Jerusalem is back in the hands of the Jewish people. And according to Luke 21, 24, the time of the Gentiles ended. Then the next sign that would occur is economic unbalance. Now, what what that means is it would be a small number of people in the world would have the food uh, in necessity or in luxuries of life and a huge number of the people of the world would have a hard time even getting bread. Uh, that started in 1978 when the mega famine occurred and now a billion people are malnourished in the world and growing. Um, and I know you have a real heart for us to reach out and do something about that, right? Oh, hundred percent. I'm seeing, uh, I have family in Lebanon still and, uh, to, to n hear from them how difficult it is for them to get basic things like bread and how they have to stand in the grocery line and their, um, economy is just trashed right now. Like they're, there's, there's the got no value to their income. And so, um, I'm seeing that and we, we have a work in Kenya where we see millions of people encounter extreme poverty and uh, you'll see a cell phone tower out in the middle of nowhere and so you, people are putting cell phone towers and yet they don't, these people don't have access to clean drinking water so when you talk about economic imbalance like people are aware of this and there's nothing to be done really unless you have people like us that are going in to build wells and do things yeah yeah one of the things that we do when we work in Kenya and uh, in other parts of the world is we have to be very, very careful not to talk about our lifestyle because it's so different from theirs. Uh, the, the amazing thing to me is the Bible does teach that there's a blessedness about those who are poor and not that we shouldn't, uh, no, not that we should leave them that way. We need to care for them and help. But it's so interesting because you already know there's so much joy yeah. when you go amongst the kids. But we've got to be careful not to make them think about all they're missing out on and they're missing out on so much. Yeah. Well, yeah, when Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit, I, you see the blessing because uh, we can, we have so much noise because of how uh, we have so many material things and that comes out as noise. And so sometimes we don't hear 
from God or look to God as clearly because we solve our own problems with all of our things. Um, There's a faith that comes from people that don't have anything because their only choice is to rely on God. And uh, we do home visits and we, you know, we ask these uh, moms, how can we pray for you? And they're like, oh, just pray for my kids. I'm okay. Just pray for my kids or my grandkids. Or sometimes they'll say, no, I'm fine. How can I pray for you? And so there's a blessing in not knowing what you're missing out on because they've got so much joy and they're so outward focused with it. It's beautiful. Yeah. And uh, every time we go, they share with us the little they have. Oh, yeah. Very hospitable people. Yes. Yeah. So anyway, that economic imbalance definitely happened. Then the next sign is a, a death of one quarter of the people on earth. So um, the Bible teaches in the last days, uh, in a very quick, short period of time, one quarter of all the population of planet Earth will die. And they'll die uh, from war, from famine, from wild beasts, and from disease. Uh, it's, it's very intriguing how disease is now such a dangerous thing. And we, we got a taste of that when COVID hit. But the World Health Organization and the Center for Disease Control have both said there are certain diseases they're watching that there are one mutation away, one mutation away from being able to wipe out one quarter of the Earth's population. And it's also interesting to me, they both use that term. They both chose 25%, and the Bible had already said it. I don't think they were quoting Scripture. It's the science. And so, uh, you know, when you look at the disease that now is uh, going around the world, you look at the devastation that's possible from one mutation of Ebola, one mutation of uh, of the the swine flu or the bird flu, uh, where it becomes the H5N1 virus. Uh, By the way, that would be the deadliest disease known to man is the flu. The H one N H one N five H five N one virus H five N one virus. You can look it up on Google. And um, you know what's the wild, Zach? Think how easy it is to get the flu. Oh yeah, it spreads super fast. I mean, if you look all the way back to the Spanish flu, um, that decimated so many yeah. lives in so many places and homes. Um, disease has the potential to literally wipe out everyone that we love, um, and that's what the Bible is getting at. It's like there's something that's coming. That's prophetic that's coming uh, that could have the opportunity to take us away. Um, and so the Spanish flu, the swine flu, polio. Um, actually, I just saw, uh, I think it was on TikTok the other day, the last guy that was in the iron lung just passed away. Oh. Um, and so, you know, that's pretty sad, but you know, disease is running rampant, and especially nowadays. Um, you know, it's, it's scary, it's eerie, um, but it's also in the Bible. Yeah, and the Bible tells us that is a sign to watch for. Uh, by the way, we're not happy about anybody no. suffering, but we do know it's a sign that Jesus Christ is coming back. And by the, it, the interesting thing, when all the ones I've been naming are, are made because of man, typically. Oh, yeah. We've wrecked the environment. We haven't cared for each other. Uh, you know, the United States alone could produce enough food to feed the world, but we won't. Um, so it's, you know, all these things are actually things that man has brought on himself. And so uh, it's, the judgment is we're reaping what we sowed. Would it be a combination? It would be war, famine, pandemic, and wild animals that would take out a quarter. Because we, we saw just recently what a pandemic can do. But when you take that in combination with war, famine, and wild animals, that, that brings it even more into reality. Yeah, oh, totally. Yeah, and it is. It's a combination of the four. In Ezekiel, those are called the four great judgments of God. I'm like the four horsemen of the apostle. Okay. <laughs> but no, but it, it's, yeah, they're, they're different. But yeah. It's totally Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's really interesting, yeah. So um, so anyway, then what will happen is after a, there, there's a death of a quarter of the world's population, there'll be a worldwide persecution of Christians. Now, right now, we can already see the tide turning on us. You know, it's interesting to note that more people have died for Jesus uh, in the 20th and 21st century than in all the other years combined. Uh, in right now people are being persecuted people are being killed uh you were just in armenia and know how in iran which is right on the border of i mean armenia um persecution of christians is really really happening in a very violent way yeah yes we got to go and visit a work that's being done in armenia and they're uh specifically going to reach unreached people groups and one of those unreached people groups would be um muslims that are in iran and um in turkey and Azerbaijan, these are border countries. They also are, were in contact with a couple in Yemen, and we got to be a part of a prayer night where they were praying specifically when you talk about economic unbalance and famine. Yemen is, is experiencing some of the worst famine that we can see. Well, 
after hosting a prayer night, this couple reported that they had 12 conversions to Christianity, Whoa. which was just so incredible. And you talk about intercessory prayer and how that matters when we start looking at these uh, people groups and unreached people groups. That becomes a real thing, but it's super dangerous for this couple. I mean, we got to hear from them. We couldn't see their faces. Everything had to be so undercover because the persecution, especially in a country like Yemen, is so real. And that for us visiting Armenia, and Armenia is technically a Christian nation, we were very aware of the persecution happening in the border countries around Armenia. Yeah, oh yeah, and I love that work that's there because it's a way of supporting Christians in persecuted regions, yes. and mm-hmm. um, and we want to do that. I mean, there are brothers and sisters in Christ and their family, and so we have to be a part of making that happen. Um, it's also, uh, you know, scary to know uh, that, you know, eventually that is going to go worldwide. Uh, every nation on earth. And Jesus said we would be hated by all nations. Um, and by the way, the interesting thing is he said hated by. Not just that they'll be against us or think we're not, uh, that we're dumb or something like that. They're literally going to hate us and come after us and seek to kill us. And then that will lead to an apostasy, which we talked about last time. The apostasy is a great falling away. When people are threatened with either, you know, uh, deny Jesus or die, they're, they're going to deny Jesus. Now, I hope you won't. I know you guys won't. Uh, I, I, I know I'm not going to. I'm already sold. I could die anyway. But, um, you know, the reality is, is it's, it's going to be a pr- pruning in the church when people are, are not able just to say, oh, I'm a Christian. In other words, you're going to have to decide, will you die for Jesus Christ? And Jesus said, uh, if anyone wants to come after me, he must take up his cross and follow me. And he would sake to save his life will lose it. But he who loses his life for my sake will find it. And so we know that there's going to be a great falling away. But also the church is going to rise up in a more powerful way. Because every time there's persecution, the church actually has revival. So I think that's so interesting to know because it seems counterintuitive, like persecution and then revival. Uh, But what will happen after that is Russia and its allies will attack Israel, which, by the way, again, uh, you know today Russia is very warlike. Uh, They're very quick to attack. Uh, You know, Putin is not only saying he wants to take Ukraine, but he also take land from Ukraine and defeat Ukraine. But he's also beginning to threaten other countries. Uh, And so China is joining with them and backing them. And Korea is joining with them and backing them. And so we're watching this uh, ally uh, group of nations allying together that would actually turn on the United States and others. Then the next sign is that the two witnesses will come. Zach, you got pretty excited about that. Yeah, I was reading into it um, when we did part one, and I was I was looking into the scripture um, of Moses, Enoch, and Elijah, and I'm going to pull up my, my notes right here really quick to, to go to it, because um, I was wondering, it says in Hebrews 9.27, it's appointed that man will die once. And so now we know one of these men never died. You actually laughed, laughed actually about two it. of them. Yeah. <laughs> two of them. You laughed about it earlier. He was like praying for God to take his life. And he's like, no, you're, you're not going to die. And so here he's begging for his life to be taken. Uh, but God was like, no, you're too special. <laughs> um, but then it goes on to say in Revelation 11, 6, and they have power over the waters to turn them into blood. Now, what if those of us have read Exodus, we would think, okay, oh, Moses turned Water, uh, the, the, the Red Sea, and then strike the earth with every kind of plague. And so Moses was the vehicle that God used to strike the world with plagues. And so I'm thinking Moses here. And then Exodus 7:17, 7, he says, with the staff that is in my hand, I will strike the water that is in the Nile and it shall turn into blood. And so here we have um, all the way on the other side of our Bible, getting uh, images and symbolism from Revelation and then it points right back to Exodus. And so I'm curious, do we have an idea of the witnesses? I, I think you have your, your two guys that you chose, but I'm seeing a, a little bit of the Bible allude to Moses, um, but also Enoch and Elijah, the guys that never died. So what do you think? Well, I would say it's Elijah is 100% one of the two. Uh, Malachi chapter 4 tells us that, so we know that's, that's for sure. Um, now, who is the other one? Well, we don't know. Uh, it could be Moses, and a lot of people think it's Moses because when Jesus was transfigured uh, and, and, and began to shine in his glory, Moses and Elijah came to talk with him. So it could be the sign that, he, that Moses will be one of the others. Uh, but I would say this, it's more likely in that moment 
that Elijah was there representing the prophets and Moses was representing the law. Mm -hmm. So it was the law and the prophets, not so much a pointing to the second coming. But Enoch never died. We know that Enoch never died. And in Jude, it talks about Enoch actually referring to the last days. And in a, a book that we do not consider biblical at all called the Book of Enoch, he does talk about the last wow. days. So it's interesting. Enoch preached about the last days according to Jude. Enoch never died. And you're right. Hebrews yeah. 9, 27 said it appointed for man to die once and then the judgment. Yeah. So interesting. Yeah. Very, very interesting. Yeah. By the way, um, I don't know if you can hear me, but I know we're having a buffering problem, you guys. So hopefully we're going to pop back on and yeah. not miss too much uh, in the midst of what's happening. So I think so. Are hey, we off? Uh, really quick, Marlon, are we good? Or Marlon, Fred, are we good? Yes. Okay. Okay. There we are. We are good. All right, we're good to go. All right, so if, uh, if you weren't on a couple of minutes ago, it's because it was buffering. Uh, I shared one of the most exciting. No, no, not really. <laughs> we didn't really. Oh, well, but you did share really cool things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we did talk about some cool stuff. But anyway, so what happens next is the two witnesses come, and they preach for three and a half years. Now, the temple has to have been built by this time because they, they preach on the steps of the temple. And so they're going to come and preach. They're going to do miracles. Miracles. Uh, there's going to be a revival in Israel, uh, people turning to the Lord and, and looking upon Jesus as Zechariah says, they'll look on him whom they have pierced and mourn for him as an only son. In other words, they're going to recognize that Jesus Christ died on the cross for their sins. Then after the two witnesses have preached three and a half years, the Antichrist is going to kill them. Uh, he's going to sweep in and kill them. And probably at that time, uh, he'll set up what's called the abomination of desolation. That means he'll go into the temple and declare himself to be God. Then sometime right after that, an, a, a, three different asteroids or three objects from outer space are going to plummet and hit the earth. And then after that, the revealing of the Antichrist in a very real way to all the world. And then the gospel will be preached in every nation to every people group, which is what you were talking about. Yeah, yeah super cool. Uh, I know that your heart is that we would be a part of reaching the last unreached people group, which is really cool. But there's quite a bit. I was surprised in going and doing this work with this organization to see how many people are still considered unreached. Yeah. The, but the good news is we can strategize and do it. Absolutely. And that's a... Another thing, you know, that we all, all Christians want to hasten the coming of the Lord. And that's the number one way to yeah. hasten the coming of the mm -hmm. Lord yep. is by reaching people for Christ. Yeah. So then the great tribulation will begin and then the rapture. So the, the, that's the timeline and that's what we're looking at. But here's one of the most important things I can tell you is that as Christians, we should not be caught off guard by all that's coming. We should be aware and we should beware based on what's coming. So in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, Zach, I want to have you read 1 to 11. Read the whole thing Got it. so people can grab a hold of that. Now as the times and the epochs, brethren, you have no need of anything to be written to you. For you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. While they are saying, peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them suddenly like labor pains upon a woman's with child, and they will not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, that the day would not overtake you like a thief, or would overtake you like a thief. For you are all sons of light and sons of day. We are not of night nor of darkness. So then let us not sleep as, as others do, but let us be alert and sober. For those who sleep do their sleeping at night, and those who get drunk get drunk at night. But since we are of the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up, just as you are also doing. Yeah, so here's some things to not miss on that. Number one, it says, while they say, verse three, while they say peace and safety, then destruction suddenly comes upon them like labor pains upon mm. a pregnant woman with or a woman with child, and they will not escape. Now, the them or they are the non-believers. So we are not to be caught like a thief. In other words, Jesus is going to come like a thief in the night, but we are to see the signs and we are to be aware of the signs of the times. We're to be aware how close this coming is. We don't know the day or hour, but we do know the season mm -hmm. and we know what's happening around us. And so that's why studies like this are so important so we can be ready yeah. for the coming of the Lord. But when the world 
uh, gets caught off guard. He comes like a thief in the night. Then it says this. It says in verse 4, You brethren are not in darkness that the day would overtake you like a thief. So one of the reasons I as a pastor want to teach on this so often, I don't want any of you caught by surprise. I don't want any of you caught off guard. I don't want any of you not looking up and getting ready for the coming of the Lord. Jesus actually said that when his, the signs begin to happen, Jesus said, lift up your heads for your redemption draws near. So the signs are happening. Now, the other thing that's interesting about this, he said it'll be like labor pains on a pregnant woman. Now, by the way, in Matthew 24, he says the same, Jesus said the same thing. Now, what does that mean? Well, when a woman goes into labor, she has labor pains, but the labor pains are further apart and not as hard. So in other words, there are, there's a pain to, I, I wouldn't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, tell me more, Chuck. <laughs> yeah, but, oh yeah, but, but they're, they're, you know, when Pam was in labor, uh, they were further apart, uh, but you know what, there was pain, but it wasn't as hard. Then they got closer and harder, closer and harder, closer and harder. And so in other words, the coming of the Lord, the signs are going to start out farther apart. They're going to get closer and more pronounced, p- closer and more pronounced, closer and more visible and then bam, it hits. The other thing about labor pains on a pregnant woman, they don't just uh, like if you're, let's say they're the labor pains are 20 minutes apart. They don't go then 18, 16, 14, they jump, you know? So, but when they jump and so even though the signs might start this far apart, which we've shown you on the timeline, they did, they're going to get closer and closer and closer. And then all of a sudden happen all at once. And so we wanted you guys to be aware of all of those things. So now we go to one of my favorite sections of scripture, Matthew chapter 24. Now, if you want to know the signs of the coming of the Lord, what you need to do is know, study Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, and the book of Revelation. Now, there are some places in Ezekiel and other places, too, we could look at. Daniel, Daniel, lots of them. But, but if you looked at those of Matthew 24, Luke thir- or Mark 13, Luke 21, and, and the book of Revelation, what you're going to find are these are the signs of the coming of Jesus Christ. Now, the other thing you're going to find is that the chronological order of the signs is the same in all those places. So it, the, these are the signs in chronological order. Now, Mark 13 and Luke 21 have a little bit different uh, putting some signs in each other, but the chronology is the same. Does that make sense? So like one would talk about pestilence and the other didn't, but it'll be in the same order. Why do you have a preference for when it's explaining it? Why do you look at Matthew 24? Is that, is that your favorite one to look at? No. Okay. Yeah. Probably Luke 21 <laughs> is. Look, we're going to look at Matthew 24. I think Luke 21 is because that's the only place Jesus says before all these things and it gives the great sign. Okay. And so I think that's so intriguing to me. Uh, but, you know, anyway, yeah, so they're all they're all good. Yeah, but, yeah, you know, like we don't pick favorites in the Bible. <laughs> we well, cherry we, pick. We <laughs> yeah. But let's go to Matthew 24 and starting verse 4. Jesus answered and said to them, see to it that no one misleads you. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will mislead many. So one of the signs of the coming of the Lord is what we call false Christ. People who claim to be either a Christian or a follower of Jesus, or maybe even say they are Jesus, and and yet they're lying and not telling the truth. So interestingly, uh, young uh, Sun Young Moon has claimed that he's Jesus. And he has millions of followers, uh, well, or at least hundreds of thousands, if not millions. And uh, so, you know, Sun Yen Moon said he actually is Jesus, and he's alive today saying that he is. Uh, Charles Manson claimed to be Jesus, and his followers uh, it, did believe he was wow. Jesus. Uh, and so there's been other people who have done that over the course of time. And so false Christ would be a sign of the coming of the Lord. Um, the next one is this, verse 6. Hmm. You will be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not frightened for those things must take place, but the end is not yet. So right now we are seeing that happen in our day and time, right? There's wars and rumors of wars, right? Yep, for sure. I love that it says, uh, see that you are not frightened. I think that, well, I love that because as he's talking to the believers here. And so our response to these things really is going to show the non-believers, like, why aren't they freaking out? But uh, if you are a believer, just have, um, when Jesus says that these things must come, know that it does have to happen and not to be afraid. And we shouldn't be afraid of, um, we have a hope that goes beyond the grave. And so that's, I think, a big part of the reason why we're not to be afraid. Yeah. And right now it's interesting to me 
and I, you and I were in a meeting, uh, and I'm not going to, well, it was Ed Stetzer. I think it'd be okay to use Ed's name. Uh, and they're talking about putting on a conference in South Korea. A very real concern he said they have is that South Korea really feels like it could happen, like it could highly likely they'd be invaded by either North Korea or China or both. Do you remember that? Yeah. And they were saying, we don't know if we're going to be able to put this conference on because there, there's a lot of signs. There's a lot of um, uh, uh, clues that they're getting that either South or North Korea alone or China will back them mm. and they would invade South Korea. And you already know that China is talking about invading Taiwan. Matter of fact, uh, not too long ago, it wasn't a question of if they're going to invade when. When are they going to invade? And so we were watching all these things happen around the world, along with the wars that are already occurring. And so there's a real fear that we're going to see the superpowers of the world embroiled in conflict uh, in, in ways that could lead to a nuclear exchange. And so, uh, it, but it does say, don't be frightened. Right. Hearing all that, you're like, ah, <laughs> but don't be afraid. It's fine. <laughs> that, yeah. That's, yeah. It but just, I'm, I'm with you again. Uh, Going to Armenia was was such a life changing trip, and I got to experience that with Pam, which was even more special. But you're ta we were talking to people that are going into these uh, very hostile countries with the word of God, and so to see them not be afraid, you really start to think through. Yeah, God doesn't tell us to not be afraid to be safe. He says no preach the gospel, take it to every nation, just don't be afraid. And that's, that's such a, it's such an interesting thing, but God doesn't give us a spirit of fear, but of love. And so knowing, knowing all of that, it's not, we don't say it lightly, don't be afraid, but really, truly, when you look at what it means to be a disciple, it, it's going and doing the hard things and, and not being afraid. Yeah, oh, totally. And uh, it, it uh, when I was first a believer, I actually thought I would like to die for the Lord. Yeah. I really, I mean, I did. I used to think that if, I, if I'm if i going to die, martyrdom is the way to go. Well, Tim Roberts, who's the head of our creative arts, his wife, Kathy, was in our youth ministry. And now, and then the, Tim and Kathy got married and they have uh, these incredible kids. But Kathy actually still wants to die for the Lord. And so she was telling her younger kids that and they got really upset and cried. <laughs> so Tim and I ride in the car and he goes, what, you want me to talk to him about what? <laughs> and he's like telling the kids it'll be okay but mommy wants to die for jesus <laughs> which That's so yeah. i remember when we were doing the revelation journal there was a thing going on in a lot of life groups because we were doing it in life groups about um last day's roulette how do you want to go do you want to go by persecution do you want to go in the meteor hits the earth do you want to wait and uh, get taken out by the famine or the wild beasts how do you how do you want to go in the last days <laughs> yeah 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 yeah. What'd you say? Uh, martyrdom. Yeah. Martyrdom. Okay. Wow. But but something quick like a beheading or something. Which is what it says will happen. There, okay. Yeah. I would probably opt in to fight a wild beast. <laughs> that'd be so fun. Oh my God. <laughs> put, put it in the chat. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Put it in the chat. How would you want to? Yeah, how would yeah. you want to go in the last Do something days? at least a little bit. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and even though we're kind of joking, what it shows is we're not afraid to die. Mm. It, it's you know what because in reality we go to heaven. Yeah. So what? We know God's got us. We know God's got our timing. We know we're not being morbid even. We're just saying, Lord, you know what? We're, we're going to rejoice even in the idea that we could glorify you that way. So verse 7 says this. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And in various places, there will be famines and earthquakes. Now, here's what's so, so interesting about nation against nation. The word nation is the Greek word ethnos. So ethnos against ethnos or ethnic group against ethnic group. So racial hatred and violence is a sign of the coming of the Lord. And so when the United States right now, and, and by the way, we, we are so heartbroken over all the racism that's happening, how one racial group will attack another or people will demean another, or they'll act like somebody's not even human because they're of a different racial group. Uh, you know, when we see all of that, we want to stand up. We want to be for justice. We want to be for defending them. But we also know it's a sign of the coming of the Lord. And so uh, all around the world, there's ethnic the conflict going on. Uh, and so we see that happening. Uh, Turkey alone just went and took some of Armenia's land, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so did Az Azerbaijan. Yeah. Uh, we, we understand racial tension here. Absolutely. When you go and you experience some of these other countries, uh, it's, it's also on another level. It's racial tension is 
international for sure. Yeah, and so it's it's rising all around the world and we're watching it happen. So kingdom against kingdom would be government against government. So it would be racial injustice, racial hatred, racial violence, and war. And Jesus said, when you see these things happening, know that I'm coming. Then he says, in various places, there will be famines and earthquakes. Mm -hmm. By the way, in Luke, uh, Zach, it adds disease. Mm -hmm. So it says famine, earthquake, and disease uh, there. So those three things would tell us about the coming of the Lord. There will be an increase in earthquake, uh, probably intensity more than activity. Because earthquakes are very active right now, but they're just not that intense. Yeah. Did you guys feel the other one, the one the other day? Yeah, we've had several, actually. I feel like in the last month, um, I, there was a, a week a month ago that I felt three uh, throughout the week. And they're minor. You know, there's three to three, 3.5. Um, there was actually a 5.0, uh, I think like 10 miles that way. But again, we don't really feel it that much. And so we have earthquakes, but... Not to biblical scale, right. <laughs> at least not yet. Well, there was a big one that hit Turkey. Yes, not yeah. that long ago too, and that had pretty big ramifications in bordering countries. So again, on an international scale, you're seeing these these things hit on a global level. Yeah, Japan's been hit really hard. Um, there was a 7.5 somewhere. And I, I I don't want to. I'm not making fun of him, but I do think it's funny. So I hope I'm not making fun of him. Pastor Sawyer's from Alabama, and he's freaked about the idea of experiencing an earthquake. Uh, and so all of us in California are like, Sawyer, it's just a matter of time. You're gonna you're you're gonna feel it's it. It's not if, it's when. Yeah, it's not if, it's when. Yeah, you get to ride the earth. So, yeah. So that's one of the signs of the coming of the Lord. Then verse 8. But all these are nearly the beginning of birth pangs. So remember I talked about the fact in 1 Thessalonians, it talks about that. But here it talks about it too. And Jesus said, this is just like birth pangs. In other words, they start far apart and they're not as pronounced, but all the believers are watching. So we see it. Uh, we watch this occurring and then it gets closer and harder and closer and harder. And so uh, we know that that's true. Then it says this, then... They will deliver you to tribulation, will kill you, and you will be hated by all nations because of my name. So remember we talked about that idea of a worldwide persecution of Christians, and we will undergo a tribulation. We will undergo uh, a, a time of, uh, you know, that's going to be very, very difficult. And so that's one of the signs of the coming of the Lord is that Christians are going to suffer. By the way, uh, we were never told we wouldn't suffer. As a matter of fact, in 1 Timothy 4.10, it says, all who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer perse persecution. All who desire or live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. So Jesus never said you won't be persecuted. As a matter of fact, he said, if, they hate, if people hated him, they'll hate us. Uh, if they, they sought to hurt him, they'll seek to hurt us. So that was part of what we said we would do when we love Jesus. We'd be willing to suffer for him. And so, again, we're not morbid in saying we want that to happen. But you know what? I would say this is I would rather stand for Christ than bow to the world. I would rather suffer persecution because I love Jesus than go along with a world that is so corrupt and evil and cruel. And so we need to be willing to take the stand and to stand firm and stand strong. But Jesus warned us ahead of time it's coming. He wanted us to know that it was coming. And he, here's the scary thing in verse 10. At that time, many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and mislead many. That's the apostasy. That's the great falling away. So remember Paul in First Thessalonians, if you were with us last first Wednesday, uh, the May 1st, or no, March 1st, March Wednesday, uh -huh. March 1st, Wednesday, we actually just really tried to stick uh, in what it says in uh, 1st Thessalonians, or 2nd Thessalonians chapter 2, where Paul says there's two signs to watch for before the rapture. One is the apostasy, and the other is the Antichrist being revealed. And so the apostasy is something Jesus said will happen here. At that time, many will fall away. And betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and mislead many. In other words, uh, there will be people who are calling themselves pastors who will come up and they'll be false prophets and deceive people and mislead people. Uh, I'm watching that happen today. I'm watching many pastors in the United States bring a false message. And they call it Christian, but it's not. Uh, very often it's a message of hate. When the Bible's very clear, the goal of our instruction is love. And so when you start seeing a message of hate, you know there's something wrong there. And yet it gets scary how uh, you could see that occurring. Uh, some churches have had a, a white supremacy takeover. 
uh, which I, I mean, I, I'm appalled at it, and you should be too. Uh, but you know what? The pastors act like they're doing something that's biblical, and they're not. Um, but in this point in time, they're going to tell people that, uh, you know, that they, they don't have to live for Jesus the way that the Bible calls for them to. I don't know that it's the case, but I think it's the case, you guys, that at this point, they're going to tell people to go ahead and take the mark of the beast. Wow. I think the mark is going to start coming at this point. The Bible says if anybody takes it, they can't, uh, uh, they can't go to heaven. Uh, but the reality is, is that uh, when we look at the mark of the beast, there's a warning to Christians not to take it. And so in Revelation chapter 14, verse 9, um, let me get there. 14, 9, it says, Then the third angel followed them, shouting, Anyone who worships the beast in his statue or accepts the mark on the forehead or on their hand must drink the wine of God's anger. It has been poured full strength into God's cup of wrath, and they will be tormented with fire and burning sulfur in the presence of his holy angels and the Lamb. The smoke of their torment will arise forever and ever, and they will have no relief day and night, for they have worshipped the beast and the statue and have accepted the mark of his name. Now notice what it goes on to say in verse 12. In verse 12 it says, Here is the perseverance of the saints who keep the commandment of God and their faith in Christ. So it's interesting. It talks about the mark of the beast. And what does it say? Christians, you don't do it. Christians don't do it. So that's one of the reasons I believe in that section I just showed you that the mark will actually start to go out. Uh, my opinion is the mark will start out voluntary and then become mandatory. Um, I have some reasons for that, but you can decide if that's right or not. But I think it'll start out voluntary, but then over the course of time, it'll become mandatory. And But Christians are not to take it either way, whether it's voluntary or mandatory. So then what happens next is in... Uh, verse 13, it says, I'm sorry, uh, verse 12, um, because lawlessness is increased, most people's love grows cold. But the one who endures to the end, he will be saved. For the gospel of the kingdom, this is the part, Tracy, we were talking about, uh, shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, then the end will come. So that's one of the big signs. And one of our prayers is that Crossroads would be a, would be a part of reaching the last people group for Christ and the last person for Christ, uh, which to us is one of the most important things ever. I do think about this, and, I, and I'm not just saying it. When we get together in times like this, I wonder if the last person to become a Christian isn't watching online. Because I wonder where in the world they might be. They could be in California. Uh, they could be in the Netherlands. I saw someone's on in the Netherlands. But the reality is this, is that, that there is a last person to reach. And what if you're it? Yeah. What if right now, one of you watching are the last person to give your life to Jesus Christ? And I give the invitation and say, would you like to commit your life to the Lord? Because he would loves you. He cares about you. Jesus, the one who told us all these things would occur, also said that he would love you with this everlasting love, that he stands at the door and he knocks. And if you would open up, he would come in and you would share life with him. Jesus said all those things. And for every one of you, that's for you. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter who you've been. It doesn't matter. How, what kind of sins you committed. Jesus Christ came to die on the cross so all our sins could be forgiven. So we could know the love of God. So we could be forgiven. So we could be new. So we could be alive. So we could have power that comes from the Holy Spirit. And right now I'm hoping some of you who are out there would say yes to the Lord. I'm going to lead a prayer where you can actually pray and say to the Lord that you want to commit your life to him. And so right now, here's the question. Do you want to say it? Do you want to make this commitment? And by the way, what if the last person's watching right now? That'd be cool, huh? That means we'd say amen and we'd just all go in the rapture. But let's go ahead and pray right now. Father, I pray for anybody who needs to commit their life to you. I pray right now they would know, Jesus, that you came to love them and to show them a life that would be incredible. And I pray right now they would pray this prayer. So I pray they can feel right now your love. They can feel your presence. No matter when they're watching, where they're watching, they can feel this. And I pray they're going to pray these words. And I'm going to ask you right now to do that. Would you pray this prayer with me? Would you say, Lord Jesus, I know you died on the cross for me and you died for my sins. I pray you'd forgive me and cleanse me from all my sin. I pray you'd heal me from hurt and from pain. 
I pray you'd free me from anything or anyone that would hold me down or hold me back. But most of all, I pray you'll make me yours. And I pray you'll make me alive. And I pray you'll make me brand new. So I say yes to you. And I say yes to the life you have for me. So take me now and make me yours. In Jesus' name, amen. And if you prayed that prayer, praise God. And Zach, what should they do if they prayed the prayer? Right now, if you prayed that prayer, we want you to text amen to 77247, letting us know that you decided to follow Jesus tonight. Um, and so make sure you text amen to 77247 using your phone. Um, one of our chat hosts will put a decision link as well in the live chat if you're on a laptop or a, uh, a tablet as well. Uh, but Chuck, thank you so much. Thank you oh. so much. And uh, Tracy, you have any last thoughts? Uh, no, I'm good. It was exciting. I would love seeing all of our comments and everyone engaged. Um, I really love seeing the ways people are choosing to go, should it yeah. come to that. <laughs> and a shout out from Laura all the way out in Finland tonight. Thanks for being with us. Super sweet. Um, but again, if you made that decision, text AMEN to 77247. And if you have questions about the end times or anything that we talked about tonight, will you please put a comment in the video after it ends? Uh, we'll go in, we'll reply to you and interact with you in that way because I think our people love this topic and we love this topic. Yeah, and I'm planning we're going to pick this up again a little bit later uh, on our first Wednesday. But I love being with you guys. So thanks for joining me, you guys. Thanks for sharing life together. Yeah, yeah. thank you, Chuck. Thank you for teaching us so well. This is not easy to go through, and yeah. you make it very um, stomachable. <laughs> stomachable. stomachable. <laughs> it's your cooking. Yeah. <laughs> it's my cooking. All right. God bless you guys.